Welcome to Scrolling to Death. Today, I have a very special guest, Rick Lane, who is a tech policy expert, a child safety advocate, and founder and CEO of Iggy Ventures. Welcome, Rick. Thank you for having me, Nikki. You're so welcome. Tell me about Iggy Ventures. I keep wanting to say Iggy Adventures. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> Can you no tell worries. me about Iggy Ventures? <laughs> yeah, so I created Iggy Ventures after I left News Corp for 16 years. I was their senior vice president um, focusing on domestic policy, mostly around tech. Um, mm -hmm. And for that, I was at the U.S. Chamber. But when I left, I wanted to do something entrepreneurial, but also stay mm -hmm. within the public policy realm. So I yeah. created um, Iggy Ventures. Iggy is short for St. Ignatius, who was the founder of the Jesuits. I went to Holy Cross mm -hmm. and Iggy was our math, name of our mascot. So oh. I decided that I wanted the name to reflect what the goals of the company were and mm -hmm. men and women for others. And so that's how I came up with Iggy Ventures. So I invest in companies. I advise companies. Um, I use it, my volunteer on child safety advocacy. And so mm -hmm. it's really the place I house my business. Okay, amazing. And we've been you know, integrated on LinkedIn for a while, but I got to meet you in person and see you speak at the Nicosi Summit in DC last month. So I really, I ran over to you after and I was like, we need to talk. And then you're like, I've already connected. We've already connected on LinkedIn. I was like, oh, you know, it's hard to un to sometimes put the, the headshot on social media to the face in person. But I'm really excited to have this conversation because you've had a front row seat to the evolution of both the tech companies and social media companies, and also the legislation that continually fails to protect our kids online. So if we could just start with, Rick, how did we get here where kids can go online really at any age and get access to some of the worst content and the worst people in the world, and there's really nothing parents can do about it? How do we get here? How do we get there? I <laughs> kind of blame myself yeah. for that because um, I was part of that um, back in the day. So how we got here was really a public policy initiative and philosophy that started in the Clinton administration, which was light touch of government and self-regulatory control, which mm -hmm. at the time made a lot of sense. This is the time of America Online and CompuServe mm -hmm. and Prodigy. And so a mm -hmm. lot of the issues that we're seeing today were not relevant back then, but the goal of the public policy initiative was let's self-regulate, we can move more quickly, and mm -hmm. we'll be able to implement safety mechanisms. Hence, you saw Section 230, CDA 230. And all of these things were around privacy and everything else was going to be in a much more hands-off government and, and working and trying to let competition compete in terms mm -hmm. of child protection. And AOL was a big advocate of this, and as he said, and others. And the philosophy was a utopian philosophy. It was like, let's try to do this differently than we've done in the past. And there was a lot of buy-in. And that's what started with you know the 96 Telecom Act with Section 230, the 1998 um, privacy bill, you know, with COPPA, uh, with Ed Markey, you know, more focusing mm -hmm. on children. And then in terms of privacy in general and oversight was like, we're going to all work together and create coalitions and put mechanisms in place to do the right thing. But mm -hmm. that went off the rails um, really with Meta and Google who came after all this. Um, you know, Yahoo was a good, good player. AOL, they were good companies. But when the new kids on the block came in, um, it really disrupted what we had all really thought would be a great way to move forward in this space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wasn't there a case or two in like early 2000s that sort of set the precedent for this shielding liability? And one was like versus America Online. Were you familiar with those? Yeah, there were, there were a bunch of cases um, that started with Section 230. And, and then within with the first case that really started having 230 go in the wrong direction. Because you have to remember, it was yeah. CDA, the child, you know, it was all about protecting children, right? Um, right, Communications right. Decency Act. It wasn't the Protect America Online Act. And <laughs> so the legislation, as I said, what we thought is what we wanted to do is make sure that companies would take proactive steps to monitor mm -hmm. their sites and take bad content down, which is a very important part of CDA 230 because at the time, if you had knowledge of harmful activities on the site, then mm -hmm. you could be potentially held accountable because you have knowledge of harm. So what we wanted to try to do was create an incentive 
for companies like AOL and others to be able to proactively monitor the site and make it more family friendly without being held responsible. Mm -hmm. But the flip side was that there was nothing in there to incentivize companies to be proactive. So they got the benefits of the protections without the obligations of taking the necessary steps to try to fix the problems. And that's what we're trying to do now with modifying Section 230 Mm -hmm. is to have, yes, we want you to be proactive. At the same time, if you're doing nothing, then we're going, you know, you don't get these protections. It's like the Earn It Act is that philosophy. And they're taking it a step further by proactively suggesting harmful content within algorithms to children. That's right. So not only not removing it, but pushing it. Yes. I mean, that's what changed. I, I think, you know, what when things started to really go badly, um, I was a point person when News Corp bought MySpace. So mm. we were the first big social networking site MySpace was, and we worked really hard to clean it up. Um, my partners and I, who were involved in the child safety side, Hamanchi mm-hmm. Nigum, who was, I hired him because... Ernie Allen, who was the CEO of NICMIC, the National Center for mm-hmm. um, Missing and Exploited Children, mm-hmm. I asked him, who's the best person I can hire to help us fix MySpace and make it more safe for our younger users? And mm-hmm. he said, Hamanchu Nigam. So he, we've become very good friends. I, told, I, I laugh now because I said, you know, if you knew that you were my only pick, you could have asked for a lot more money when we hired <laughs> you. Um, but he, we really worked hard and, and we wanted to make MySpace safe. And we also had the authority to do that from our CEO, from Rupert Murdoch. I mean, we mm-hmm. were able to go into MySpace and say, you can't roll out this product or this functionality because it's going to harm children. And if they mm-hmm. push back, we say, okay, talk to Rupert. And they would never do that. But we had that authority. At the same time, we were watching Facebook move fast and break things. And so all these harms that we were watching, we were telling then Attorney General Bloomberg and then Attorney General from North Carolina, um, the current governor, um, we were telling them, Facebook's a mess. And they're like, oh, well, you're the big guys on the street. You know, you're, whatever you do, they'll follow. And we were like mm-hmm. working hard to clean up. Our business people weren't happy with us, but we wanted to do the right thing. And Facebook just kept doing what was the wrong thing to do. We knew it. We could see it. They were competitors. Mm -hmm. We had the research, yet they got away with it and they never followed. So all the issues that are happening now on Facebook, we knew back in 2008, 2009, there's been no change. So this is this is nothing new. And I spoke with uh, Facebook whistleblower David Erb last week, and he explained Mm -hmm. that when he was at YouTube, they talked about. So it was an example of kind of what you're saying is they talked about doing live video. So live streaming video. And it was supposed to be at the time there was cops who were doing bad things. And Mm -hmm. so it was sort of like a bystander. You could start a live video, capture it, and it's already out there. Uh, And they decided after reflecting that this is going to be a problem, especially for children, because people are going to live stream violence and suicides and murders and all these things. So, So they nixed it. But then shortly after, Facebook just added it, knowing the harm and knowing the risk without you yeah, know, we nixed prioritizing that. Yeah, we nixed yeah. it too at MySpace. No, we had that conversation. Um, and I, we were like, we can't do this because of the harm. And so we didn't roll it out either. We, in our business, people were not happy because it was like going to make it mm. sticky. You know, you're going to get yeah. advertising. And, all these, and we're like, but what happens when it gets used for evil? And children mm-hmm. are being harmed live. Mm-hmm. How right. are we going to deal with that? And they yeah. didn't have an answer, so we didn't roll it out. Well, that's so hard to monitor li- live stream video. It's, in, it's you know? impossible. Right. Okay. That's a great example of, and, and Meta is just the worst. <laughs> and I know TikTok has live video as well, live yes. streaming, and that's where a lot of kids are seeing live murders and live suicides. It's not just the live, it's the replaying of it. I mean, there's, you know, there's yeah. one father whose daughter was murdered live. She was a reporter in Virginia and he constantly is still fighting takedowns of oh her being murdered. Li- you know, uh, so it's not just when it happens live, it just stays up. And you don't have any recourse to get these entities to take it down. So imagine that as a parent, you, mm. you're you trying to take this stuff down and they're just saying, nope, you know, we're not going to do it. 
And that's a choice, Rick, because there the AI technology exists to scan an entire platform, find duplicates of a c- piece of content Absolutely. and pull it down. And so they're leaving it up because it's probably got a ton of views and they're making money off of it. It doesn't matter what the reason is. They're just doing yeah. it. And that's right. wrong. Yes. And there is no sure. good reason, right? Yeah, right. That, Money right. or whatever it happens to be, inconvenience, yeah. cost, whatever it is, they're doing it. And that just is why as someone who was very active in the self-regulatory world of Mm -hmm. the internet in the early days, um, I've really worked hard to focus on legislation that helps keep and hold these sites accountable because Mm -hmm. we tried it to do it the right way and the Mm -hmm. other companies took advantage of that. And so now we have to have more regulation to ensure that there is a cost of doing business when you're creating Mm -hmm. products and services that create harm. Right. Okay. And I want to talk about that legislation in a moment, but because I'm curious, what happened to MySpace? <laughs> oh, well, some of them, some, some of the business people blame us because we weren't <laughs> letting them, you know, move fast and break things, right? There's uh-huh. part of that. Um, yeah. My personal view of what happened with MySpace um, was we made a really bad deal with Google. Mm-hmm. Um, we did a deal where Google became the search engine and could sell remnant ads. It was a $900 million deal. And when I saw Mm. that, they didn't consult me on it because I would have said no. But when Mm. I saw that deal, I said, we just basically gave MySpace to Google because one, they're going to have all the information on search, right? So they're going to be able to combine across all the websites that they already control. I mean, Mm. most people don't realize Safari is a Chrome search engine, right? It's owned by Google. Mm. Really? Um, Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Safari. I didn't know. Yeah, that's Google pays billions of dollars to Apple to be its search engine. Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's part of the antitrust litigation. I'm like, I'm not using that Google app. I'm just going to use Safari because it's default yeah, no, it's, on my it's phone. All, it's all, <laughs> it's, the it's same. part. It's part of oh, Chrome. Um, okay. Now there may be some. There's some information that they don't. Google doesn't get mm-hmm. because or Alphabet, whatever you want to call it, doesn't mm-hmm. get because of the deal, but they, they're paying Apple a ton of money mm. and they're not doing that because they want to give Apple a ton of money. There's some right. obviously <laughs> tremendous amount of benefit. So, and that's what they did. Like if you go to, and again, this may be old information, but like Xfinity, if you search mm-hmm. on Xfinity, that's Chrome. So they have a lot of the search engine bars that most people don't realize are not the entities are there. And that's how they get mm-hmm. more and more information. So my argument was that not only is Google going to get all the information on MySpace users mm-hmm. and all their interactions, but also mm-hmm. they're selling remnant ads. Remnant ads are the ads that are placed on a page that don't sell by the company mm-hmm. itself. So they're like okay. fillers that come in. And yeah. so my argument was that if Google has the remnant ads and the search, and I'm trying to be a MySpace sale, ad sales, and I go to Coca Cola, I'd say, oh, spend a million dollars on MySpace to advertise Coke. And Google comes in and says, spend a million dollars on Google ads. And not only will you be on MySpace, but you'll be mm-hmm. on a thousand other websites. Whoops. And, and no, who didn't do that was Facebook. This is one of the things. So Microsoft tried to get the same deal with Facebook. They invested mm-hmm. early investors in Facebook and they wanted Bing to become the search engine. Mm-hmm. And Zuckerberg and the team were smart enough to say, no way, you know, that's the data is the oil, you know, that's going to fuel our business and we're not Mm going to give it away to Microsoft. Um, Mm -hmm. The folks at MySpace, I don't think were sophisticated enough at the time to understand the power of data and what it Mm -hmm. meant to hold your own data. Speak more about the power of the data. What is the value of our data, the data that we're giving up for free to use these platforms? It's targeted advertising right? It's knowing what you like and being able to specifically tell an advertiser that you're hitting the demographics that you want. So in traditional media, which I was very much part of on the Fox side, right? Fox television Mm -hmm. and the cable channels. Mm -hmm. When you're selling advertisements, you're selling it to how many eyeballs you have, right? We have this many eyeballs and a good percentage of those eyeballs like beer, right? So we're going to do yeah. beer ads um, yeah. or watch football, right? And we could sell. Mm-hmm. But it's it's contextual around mm-hmm. sort of the demographic of the audience. And then you get that demographic 
from Nielsen ratings, right? And they say, mm-hmm. okay, so that's how you pitch traditional media around contextual advertising. Mm-hmm. When Google came in and with Meta and the online sites, they said, we can do targeted advertising. So what that means is we can target people who are interested specifically in the product that you're trying to sell based mm-hmm. on a thousand different factors. Mm-hmm. And so I'm watching a show on YouTube. I will see different ads than Nikki, than you will, right? Based yeah, on our preferences right. of what we like. Mm-hmm. And that is very powerful because the old line in the advertising world was 50% of your advertising dollars are wasted. The problem is you don't know which 50%. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> okay. Google and Meta and then Amazon and the other mm-hmm. companies could say, we can predict better of what people are interested because we have so much more data than traditional mm-hmm. television, traditional media, newspapers, classified. You know, mm-hmm. you're not just blasting it to everybody, hoping that some people watch it. You're mm-hmm. arguing it to those who are quite interested. But that also became the problem because online media was the lowest basis. And the, and the horrible analogy I will use is that, you know, if I'm interested in selling, you know, a product, I don't care if the people are bad or good, as long as they're right. interested in the product. Right. So, right. and if I can generate eyeballs because it's horrible content of mm-hmm. things that you and I would not like to see online, but it's generating mm-hmm. a tremendous amount of eyeballs, then I will run that. And that's what's going to help me make more money mm-hmm. versus yeah. traditional media. And something I reported on this morning was that Meta is boosting through ad dollars, ad, ads for nudify apps, yes, ads, ads for illicit drugs, ads for fake driver's licenses, <laughs> ads for counterfeit money. Like they're making money off of illegal activities. How is that allowed to happen? I, I did a, a, I was interviewed for an article in the Washington Post um, in yeah. 2018 on this issue. Um, and so this is nothing, this is back to the MySpace days. It, it's sort of, they say we can target ads and we have all this information, yet somehow mm-hmm. they can't stop illegal drug sales. And it's right. even worse than that because the way I describe it is that if you look at illegal drug sales and, and you'll hear from Meta and the, and Reddit is also, and then these other entities, TikTok, they say, well, that's not the normal user. They don't normally see advertisements. Mm-hmm. And I say, well, it's probably, that's probably true because I don't know where the drug dealers are in my area. But if I was a mm-hmm. drug addict, I bet I know where they all are. Mm-hmm. Right. And what happens with the algorithms is that people like to describe these algorithms as rabbit holes, right? You kind of go down. And yeah. what I say is that they are basically black holes. They they suck you in until you can no longer see the, the light. And mm-hmm. they're able to, all of a sudden you are interested, you may have, your eyes may have watched a illegal drug ad for a little too long or what they're doing and they're able to target you. And then more and more, and this is what mm-hmm. these reports show, is all of a sudden I'm getting hundreds of illegal drug ads, mm-hmm. yeah. right? Because I've now shown an interest and the algorithm is pouring that into me. And if I have mm-hmm. a drug problem, that's basically, it's the same type of thing, right? It's sort mm-hmm. of, I, I need more and more and more. And the algorithms basically work like an addictive drug. Yeah, for sure. And they withhold, who shared this with me? Uh, Josh Golan at Fair Play. He said that TikTok, it'll withhold a video that they know you're really going to love until they get an indication that you're going to leave the app. And then they hit that video so that it keeps you on. Well, as, as you may know, Nikki, I helped lead the effort on the TikTok divestiture legislation. Yes. So I have a lot yeah. of research data of the power of their algorithms and what they're mm-hmm. able to do to manipulate people, not just young people, but people of all ages. And mm-hmm. you're seeing that power in a geopolitical way. I mean, just mm-hmm. today, the attorney general um, went after a company in Tennessee because of the media that they were providing uh, misinformation and disinformation for the election. Um, mm-hmm. So our adversaries know this power. They know that the algorithms will take people to very dark places and they're utilizing it against our own national interests. But mm-hmm. companies like Facebook and others 
their algorithms are harming our children and they know it. And yet they're not willing to take the necessary steps to, to help prevent it. Right. And that applies across all platforms, but TikTok is unique in that it has, uh, it is owned by a Chinese company. And so if we can talk about TikTok for a moment Mm -hmm. in April, the National Security Act passed that requires TikTok to be sold to an American company or we will remove it from our app stores here in the U.S. Then in May, TikTok sued our U.S. government, mm-hmm. I assume that's the right, <laughs> to uh, to try to overturn the law based on First Amendment rights. Correct. Uh, there's been additional legal action since then. Uh, so if you can bring people up to speed on this and mm-hmm. why it is so important that we get a handle on TikTok. Sure. Um, so the divestiture bill is not a ban bill, as TikTok tries to claim. It's a right. divestiture bill. And it's really, it doesn't have to be an American company. It just can't be a company that is based in an adversarial nation. So it okay. comes down to China, Iran, North Korea, the, that okay. type of company. So it could be a UK company. It could be an Australian company. It could be any Got company. It. Um, it, so it doesn't have to be an American company. And the the problem is that... and the way the legislation is designed, they're trying to claim, TikTok is claiming it's First Amendment. This Mm -hmm. is not about the content of the site. You can have, this country has a very strong First Amendment, awful but lawful, as we like to say. Mm -hmm. It's very hard. And we've seen that with some of the court cases on child protection. Mm -hmm. But this is about an entity that has connections to the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, and they have a philosophy, the CCP, of utilizing social media to disrupt our democracy, to undermine our democracy. And they have a tool of, you know, in the, with their phones of a, in 170 million Americans' hands that mm-hmm. they know our likes and dislikes and what will tick us off. That's my line, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and how to generate division. And mm-hmm. so at a critical time in a geopolitical situation, let's say invasion of Taiwan, they're able to create unrest in areas that could be detrimental to our national interests. And so it's a national security issue of the ability of using an algorithm Mm -hmm. as a weapon against the United States of America. So it's not a free speech issue. It's a conduct issue. It's an issue of utilizing a technological tool that can undermine our democracy and our national security. And a new study, and I wonder what your thoughts are, by NCRI and I think Rutgers showed Mm -hmm. that TikTok psychologically manipulates users in favor of China. So can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, And I'm very familiar with with the study. And what it shows is that on issues like Tiananmen Square or the Dalai Lama, or in other areas that are geopolitical, Kashmir is another one that's really fascinating, that Mm -hmm. the videos that people are seeing are more likely, not just more likely, highly likely percentage-wise to be on the side of the Chinese position on those issues than a 50-50 split. And Mm -hmm. what the research has shown is that like, if it's social issues like um, Taylor Swift, right? And you, you have Instagram and TikTok. It's usually 50-50. Even political, like Democrats and Republican, is around 50-50. On other geopolitical issues, the numbers just get sometimes 20 to 1, you know, 100 to 1. <laughs> and it's just unprecedented. And, you, and they documented that using TikTok's own data, which they, once they started using the tool that TikTok had, TikTok shut uh-huh. it down three days after the report came down. And so that they're, they're every not time. using the tool the right way. <laughs> like they, <laughs> right. I mean, the, this uh, Center for Countering Digital Hate, Imran Ahmed, they published a study mm-hmm. uh, count, showing us the number of eating disorder hashtags, for example, on TikTok. Right. And then like the next day, that number was gone. You couldn't find it. Right. So <laughs> yeah, they, they, we should know that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, part of the thing, and, and this is the difference and. Reels has this problem now too, but Mm -hmm. the way to think about it is when we all started joining like Facebook, I only saw posts of my friends, right? It's sort of like, I'm a friend with you, I'll see your post and you'll see mine. Mm -hmm. And then it's really kind of contained. And then when you got to Instagram, it was follower. So if I follow you, I would see your post. If I didn't Mm -hmm. follow you and follow someone else, I would see their post. 
Mm-hmm. What TikTok has created that Reels is now trying to replicate is they're sending what they think you want, which means that they can send you what they want. Right. <laughs> so if I, so it becomes a one to a million or one to 170 million, but I can mm-hmm. target each individual with what will move that, which will move the dial. I mean, the, yeah. the movie, The Social Dilemma, yeah. if you think about that documentary, and in the hands of a foreign adversary, being able to turn the dial just enough to create doubt and chaos mm-hmm. in a democracy, it's scary. And yeah. so, and we have the evidence that that dial is being turned and we can't wait for it to be in a crisis situation and say, oh my gosh, TikTok is being used by the CCP because there's never going to be a smoking gun per se, but there's mm-hmm. going to be, you know, it's, it's being used and therefore we try to shut down and by then it's too late. And mm-hmm. so what the national security folks in the U.S. and around the, you know, the Australians and UK and mm-hmm. Europeans all know is that the power of the algorithm of TikTok mm-hmm. in the hands of the CCP and where the power of decision making is mm-hmm. creates the national security threat. Got it. Yeah. And to bring this down to be more relevant to parents who are listening, the psychological manipulation of that algorithm. It applies, and from what I'm seeing in my conversations with teenagers and with parents and everybody in between, they're creating a divide between the child and the parent. They're saying it's like TikTok wants the kids to trust TikTok for information, to guide their decisions, and not go to their parents and not rely on their parents or their teachers uh, or trust them. So it's like this, it's like they're putting a wedge between the family unit even. Yeah, Do you have I, any opinion on that? Yeah, I think this, this, the, the two things that really scared me during the legislative fight was, mm-hmm. one, when TikTok used the power of its platform to have 14-year-olds calling members of Congress and the Commerce Committee and mm-hmm. telling them you know, that they were going to kill the members or kill themselves if the legislation mm-hmm. was enacted. That just right. I was in the offices. Uh, I was with some of the Commerce Committee um, staffers when their bosses were in the classified briefing when this was happening. And it was yeah. bizarre. I mean, it was it was incredibly they, scary to watch because that. Because, Rick, am, am I right that they weren't letting the kids onto the app until they clicked the call button? Yes, to call the members. And they didn't know what they were talking about. And they're like, you're going to take away my TikTok and, you know, and I'm going to find your family. I mean, it was like, it was bizarre, but it backfired because as the members of Congress and the Commerce Committee were getting a briefing by the national security apparatus about Mm -hmm. the harms of TikTok, it was happening real time back in their offices. So they come back and our staff is like, oh my gosh, like I was kind of hesitant before, like where you should be, but (laughs) you know. This is scary. This is really, and they were targeting this specific commerce committee. So it wasn't like every member. And they were so, geofencing by location. By location, and, by geolocation. Yeah. 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 Like using it, it was, using was, kids to do their political bidding. <laughs> like, no, absolutely. You know, absolutely. And so that part of it is truly, truly scary. And then, as I said, the power of the algorithm to divide. The other thing that really was scary is when you would hear young people say, well, there's no difference that the Chinese government has my data than the American government. Mm -hmm. And I was like, do you know, there's no free speech in China, right? There Mm -hmm. is a difference between the U.S. We have a Fourth Amendment here that if the U.S. government is collecting data, that they could be in violation of our Constitution. And yes, sometimes they overstep their bounds. And then, yes, they can be held accountable. But in China, they can just knock on your door and take you away. Wow. And and so it's not the same. But the image that they're being projected on TikTok is, oh, this China is great. And, you know, they're, they're, they don't all this rhetoric that you hear around, you know, the Dalai Lama or Tiananmen Square or mm-hmm. the Uyghurs and all those types of issues. They don't really exist. That's just, mm-hmm. you know, made up Western propaganda. And and the kids so, are believing it because they don't know any better. Yeah. Uh, well, they believe 30-second videos. They think they <laughs> that's their opinion is based the, off of The yeah. other thing that we were able to show also is yeah. that 40% of under the age of 
24 get their, quote, news from TikTok. Mm -hmm. The amount of misinformation and disinformation that they're thinking is real is concerning. Yes. Yeah. Because they think it's their news. I think it's real news. Yeah. Okay. Uh, So to close out on TikTok, should parents let their kids use TikTok? No, um, they should not. And I think it's also horrible that U.S. businesses are promoting TikTok and political campaigns. I think Mm -hmm. the fact that both presidential candidates are on TikTok when the U.S. Congress and the administration has deemed TikTok a national security threat through legislation and these politicians are still on it, I think is horrendous because they may argue, well, we're going to see how the, we're going to see how the legislation goes, you know, in the courts. The courts are determining is the legislative fix constitutional, but Mm -hmm. the decision that TikTok is a threat to our national security was made by the vote and the signing of the bill. Right. So this may not, you know, we may lose in court. It's always a possibility. I don't think we will. I think we have Mm -hmm. better arguments. But Mm -hmm. the determination is that because TikTok is a national security threat, here is the remedy that we can get through to help fix the national security threat. And the fact that you have businesses like Amazon just doing a big deal called Handshake with TikTok to Mm -hmm. selling products on TikTok, or you have a local news organization's follow us on TikTok, I just think is crazy. And yeah. I think that is a, a shame that they're putting profits ahead of our national security. Yeah. Yikes. Okay. That was an aha moment for me. I didn't think about it that way. Um, okay. Really quick before we get into the bills that we want to talk about, uh, what do you think about the arrest of Telegram CEO Pavel Durov for uh, the charges of enabling a bunch of bad stuff, child exploitation, child sexual abuse material, terrorism conversations, all the things? What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think, first of all, um, when people on, in the tech community in the U.S. complain about COSA, I say, well, wait until we make it criminal. Um, right mm-hmm. now, it's only civil. <laughs> right? Oh, um, <laughs> so, yeah. so I think it's the reality of the the tension between protecting children and national security and the stability of democracies versus anonymity. Mm -hmm. And anonymity, at least from a U.S. perspective, is not part of the U.S. Constitution. We have First Amendment rights. We have a right from legal search and seizure, but we don't have anonymity rights. I can't Mm -hmm. sit in a dark you know, house with my windows covered with a gun and shoot people and say, you can't come and get me Mm because I have a right to be anonymous, right? Right. Anonymity is, is not a right in this country. Having the ability to protect your privacy is important and encryption, but I don't think you should have a right for end-to-end unbreakable encryption. I think law enforcement should have access and the ability to access that for national security and child protection issues. Mm -hmm. And so when you have somebody who is putting national security of a country like France and child Mm -hmm. protection that's happening in France over you know, the protecting their citizens, I think Mm -hmm. they should be held accountable for that. Yeah. And so just because I'm on an encrypted app doesn't mean that I can do illegal things (laughs) because no one can track it. Well, yeah. And and then you shouldn't be able to facilitate that, right? Right. So uh, one up, yeah. It's facilitation of the illegal activity. And I'm not saying that they have to monitor, like we we have issues here with the common carriers, right? You know, they're Mm -hmm. not responsible to monitor all the calls. But if Mm -hmm. the FBI wants to wiretap a phone, Mm -hmm. they have the ability to do that at the head end. So Telegram is end-to-end encrypted. Does that mean that they themselves can't track the conversation? Yes. Okay, so they don't know what's going on. They don't know. It's, it's, uh, you know... You know, hear no evil, see no evil, talk no evil. Right. Um, philosophy, um, mm-hmm. and which completely puts communications in in the dark that no mm-hmm. one can see. So, and they're like, well, I mean, it's what WhatsApp just did, right? It's what Facebook just did with WhatsApp. Yeah. That went to unbreakable right. end-to-end encryption, and now they're going to say, well, you know, we can't monitor. So Nick Mick numbers, you know, that's why Nick Mick strongly opposes that national security mm-hmm. to employ children um, mm-hmm. because. All of a sudden, you have a whole mechanism. And then if you look at even the illegal drug sales that are mm-hmm. happening on these websites, and I have a video I could send you, you end up, they push you off of 
you know, Instagram to WhatsApp. Right. And then have the communication right. on WhatsApp for the final right. sale. And yeah. and you're able to watch this whole flow mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. all it goes dark. And yeah. I think that is a huge problem from a law enforcement standpoint. Mm -hmm. And especially that children and adults can communicate in an encrypted manner. And that's where, you know, there's a lot of illegal stuff that can be done in those type of communications. But here I'm most worried about our kids. Yeah, I want to be clear about encrypted yeah. communications yeah. and unbreakable end-to-end -end encryption. Those are okay, two yeah, different sure. types of things. Okay. And they get Thank mixed you. up. I think I'm purposed by those on the other side. So yeah. I believe in strong encryption, right? I like that when I send emails now, they're encrypted and, and someone just can't pick my emails off the open web. Or mm -hmm. when I use a cell phone now, back in the old days, when it was analog, people could listen into your cell phones, right? Mm -hmm. Now <laughs> it's encrypted from my phone okay. to yours, right? So yeah. encryption in of itself for banking records and a whole host of other things, uh, medical records. Yes, you want encryption to be strong, but there is yeah. somewhat of a trade-off when it's unbreakable. And right. what happens with the other side does is they'll say, well, you, you want your financial bank information, you know, that all of a sudden you want that to be encrypted. The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that law enforcement can go to the bank and get it un <laughs> unencrypted, right? They can track and have mm -hmm. access to the deals that were mm -hmm. made for money laundering purposes, right? For illegal transactions. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so the, tr the, the communication's encrypted, which is fine. It's what happens at the either end. Is there a mechanism or a way to unencrypt it in order to protect um, people from harm? So why would these social media platforms or these tech companies allow for messaging apps that are unbreakable and end-to-end -end encrypted? Why wouldn't they just use regular encryption? Because it's a selling point. Mm -hmm. it, it, you Privacy. can sell it, you know, you mm -hmm. say, I mean, you see that in the conversations and look at, you know, Apple's ads, we're all about privacy. Yeah. You know, this is the you know, best ads. I mean, look at, you know, Telegraph and how popular it was because it was unbreakable. The problem is, is that you, that's why it's used by criminals. It's a selling point. Y selling point and removes liability and removes liability absolutely correct yeah. it's it's a okay. twofer yeah twofer god okay what's it going to take to change all this obviously um we want to put kids first but it's more than that like these companies are obviously harming kids for profit uh for their benefit so what do we have legislation that could potentially fix the situation that we're in yeah, I mean, it's never, nothing's going to be a hundred percent. So we always have yeah. to start off with that, right? There's always right. going to be problems. We're always going to have to improve and mm -hmm. legislation in of itself isn't going to fix all these problems, but mm -hmm. it's important to have the legal foundation to hold these sites accountable for mm -hmm. their conduct. And I think yeah. that's what we're, you know, why we're strong supporters of the Kids Online Safety Act, COSA, right? Yeah. Because it's a conduct bill. It's not a content bill. Um, mm -hmm. The TikTok divestiture bill, it's a conduct bill, not a content bill. And so um, safety by design legislation and then broader privacy bills that are out there um, to help protect the collection and use of information. I do have some strong concerns about the COPPA 2.0 that was in the mm -hmm. Senate. Um, I've always had some concerns about it, mm -hmm. but I think that mm -hmm. with the advent of AI, I think the COPPA mm -hmm. 2.0 was actually more harmful than good. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to talk about that as well. Yeah, we we can do that separately. I have an interview with Don Hawkins next week at Nicosia, oh, and I know yes. she feels similarly. So let's follow back up on that because I'm very curious about that. Uh, and COSA uh, is something I've been focusing on a lot. I have tons of interviews that have come out and are coming out about COSA, kind of talking about the headlines around it, um, talking about scenarios, like what would if COSA was passed, what differences would I see in my child's feeds or social media mm -hmm. activities? So, so there's a lot there already for parents. And you mentioned that legislation isn't going to fix all the problems. And so parents really have a responsibility to get educated and make safe decisions in our home and do our best with the tools we have available to protect our kids. So what advice do you have for parents with knowing we don't currently have any new legislation <laughs> to help us out. So what, how do we handle this when it comes to social media access? 
Well, I think part of it is making sure your children understand that what they're putting online is there forever. Mm -hmm. Um, and nothing is private. Um, even in, in an encryption, if I can see it on my phone, I can snap, take a picture of it and then send it around because I'm on the other end of the encryption, right? Yeah. So there is never, nothing is ever completely in images can go away. You, they run that risk. Um, I think there's a lot of groups out there that have great educational tools for parents. Uh, NICMIC, the National Center for Missing Exploited Children, have three mm-hmm. tools. Um, Donna Rice Hughes, Enough is Enough. They have a lot of 101 on child safety. So there's a mm-hmm. lot of organizations for free advice of how to protect your kid. There's technologies out there that are important that to be used that are off the shelf. It just takes a parent to know where these products and services are. And that's the hard mm-hmm. part. I mean, I always ask parents, how many of you use the V chip in your, on your television, mm-hmm. which is mandated by Congress, the oh, V chip. I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's part of the problem. It's the parental controls um, oh. on your television is controlled by what's known as the V chip. Um, okay. And so, and then now satellite, um, like, you know, the cable companies now have as part like parental controls on their, yes. but most okay. parents don't use the parental controls. Um, and they're available for parents to use. And, and that's been always been the problem with some of the parental controls. That is why I think it would be important for tech companies to have the parental controls on and have the parents or the users have to turn them off. Yes. That way it's easier for parents to be able to, you know, they give their kids a phone, they know that the tools are already mm-hmm. on to help protect mm-hmm. them. And then having third-party entities have the ability to provide those tools. I've heard about some legislation, maybe from John Pizzurro at Raven, that might be coming next year that gives more control to the like device ID level of the phone so the device knows how old your the user is and doesn't allow certain things to be downloaded if they're not, say, 13 for social media. Yeah, I mean... You have to be careful with that because that's, you know, Meta has been pushing that, right? You know, well, okay. we it should be the app stores that should be the parental control center yes. area. And I the answer is that's one, but also has to fall onto the mm-hmm. social networking sites themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So it can't be just, oh, we're just going to push this all on Google and Apple and, mm-hmm. and the app stores to be mm-hmm. the parental control, you know, the parental controls and the age mm-hmm. verification agents. But yeah. the tool is there to be used, and there should be a mechanism, what we would call read and respond, to mm-hmm. these types of age verification technologies that will mm-hmm. provide um, important protections for children. And for now, I listeners know I like the Bark phone product mm-hmm. because parents have complete control over what their kids can download, and it does allow for social media if you want to add it at some point. Uh My last question, I think, uh, before you tell me a little bit more about your work, I'm of the mind that kids don't need social media and that the feeling of being left out is better than the harms that they'll be introduced to on social media. So how do you feel? Do you feel that kids need to have access to social media at some point? That's a tough question, to be honest, Mm -hmm. because it depends on what type of social media you're talking about right? Mm -hmm. Um, Because that's a very broad definition. I do think that Instagrams and the TikToks and and other sites, Mm -hmm. I do think they create tremendous amount of harm. And I really do think there should be, the kids should not be on them um, up to a certain age. Okay. I do love the idea of schools not allowing kids to be on their phones during the day. I never understood why that was necessary. I think the parents are part or a big part of the problem because they're helicopter parents. And they want mm-hmm. to know 24-7 where their kids are. I mm-hmm. think I like John Haight's uh, philosophy. I, I'm a follower yeah. of his um, on a lot of these issues. He's right. I, I don't, I've never tracked my kids. It's, it's mm-hmm. To me, it's weird, but I have a lot of people I know do it, um, even with their adult kids. And I just think right. it's kind of weird. I, I wonder <laughs> what we're – yeah, I agree. And I wonder because kids – and we'll close out in a second, but kids are being tracked through watches from like four or five, six years old. And they know that they're being tracked. And they – so what is that going to do to them 
how is that going to help or harm their development and their autonomy and independence as an adult? I just don't, doesn't feel right. They're never alone. They're never, yeah. right? And the, the, so you have to do a little bit of trust um, yeah. with kids, which is hard. I mean, I still, yeah. my son's 21 years old, drove yeah. to college for the first time. and I'm still worried. I was like, <laughs> I, I was 21. I was driving. Like, I, why do I look at it so differently? Yeah. <laughs> and so it, that's it, that as a parent, it's always how you're going to feel. But sometimes you just you know, have to take a deep breath um, and let it go. Yeah. But one area that I think gets completely overlooked in a lot of the conversations is mm-hmm. the fintech world and the mm-hmm. use of Venmo and Cash App and mm-hmm. these other types of mechanisms for digital currencies and the amount of information that's being collected that will fall outside of any privacy legislation because fintech falls under what is known as Graham Leach Bliley, um, which is the financial privacy law which has a mm. whole different set of requirements that were designed for adults and not kids. And now that kids are using Cash App and Venmo and all these other different type of digital fintech um, wallets, digital wallet, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. they're being tracked at a very early age and their spending habits. And there's no rules around the collection and use of that information. And there is no ability to opt out of affiliate sharing when mm-hmm. under Graham Leach Bliley. And I think that's an issue that needs to be looked at more carefully. Okay. Let's follow up on that. Is there any final advice you have for parents related to social media? Yeah, I think it's really important to talk to your kids um, about what they're doing online and have those conversations. Just mm-hmm. like you talk to your kids before you give them the keys to the car about don't mm-hmm. drink and drive, You know, be aware, don't text. All these conversations that we have for the physical world, we need to have those conversations. But I am more worried about the kids who don't have strong parents or have no parents at all. Kids in foster care, the homeless, you know, kids who are highly at risk and they don't have adults around. And I think too often in these conversations where you have people on the other side of the issue say, well, it's the parent's responsibility. Yes, parents do have a responsibility, but what about the kids who just don't have parents? And those are the vulnerable kids that I feel we need to think about in these conversations more so than we have in the past. Thank you for bringing that up. And I was just talking about foster kids this morning at the coffee shop with the girl (laughs) behind the counter uh, because she works with foster kids. And I had heard recently that in some foster care systems, uh, the, the foster parent can't remove phones from the foster children so they can have them in their room all night and the parent it's like I can't do anything about it I they have to have it with them and so that's creating a lot of harm and there's just a lot of barriers to protection for children in that in those positions and so um, we need the legislation to add some safety absolutely that's the, those are the, the children I worry about um, that just don't have strong parents and parenting and and we need to make sure that the social networking sites have the protections in place and are legally required to mm-hmm. do safety by design. Yeah. Okay, Rick, you are a warrior in this fight for kids, and I really am grateful for you. Uh, can listeners connect with you somewhere um, and learn more about your work? I do all my posting on LinkedIn. Um, so yeah. if you want to know anything about issues that I work on um, from I can with issues and who is to child safety. It's all there. So you can find all my postings and my ramblings on LinkedIn. Okay. Thank you, Rick. And let's follow up with another conversation about any of the topics that we didn't get to dive into today. There's so much there. Thank you, Nikki, again for having me. I am a big fan of what you're doing and please (sighs) keep it up. Thank you so much, Rick. I appreciate you. All right. 